Around the world, Muslims spend their lives keeping hundreds of strict laws. Many even give their lives as martyrs in hopes of spending eternity with Allah. But for even the most devout Muslim, there are no guarantees of paradise. Five times a day, every day. The Islamic call to prayer stirs the faithful in mosques and madrasas, in homes and on the streets of Muslim communities around the globe. The prayer, as old as Islam itself, summons 1.6 billion Muslim followers to bow before Allah. Islam is a religion in which daily one is confessing, daily one is searching, daily one is praying. And daily, Muslims are trying to please him and find favor with a God who demands only absolute obedience. The idea of a personal God doesn't exist at all. And the Quran doesn't make any attempt to present him in that fashion. He is a master. I am just a servant. I must fear him. What Muslims do have are laws, laws given in the Quran that must be perfectly followed if a Muslim ever hopes to find and get close to Allah. Your righteousness, your standing with God is based upon and premised upon what you do. And so the more you can actually uh, do, the more you can actually be committed to the tenets of Islam, um, it heightens your possibility to make it into the, uh, the hereafter. Praying five times a day is one of the five tenets or pillars of Islam. Uh, the Muslim must also declare that Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet. Every Muslim must fast during the month of Ramadan. He must give money to charity and finally go on a pilgrimage to Mecca if they can. Whether Sunni, Shia, or any other branch of Islam, all are judged at the end of their lives according to their works and how well they followed the tenets of the faith. In Christianity, we search for God so we can have communion with God. We can be one with God. We can have a relationship with God. In Islam, Muslims search for Allah in order to pay him back a debt. They pray, they fast, they give him alms. And even then, there are no guarantees you'll be with Allah. It's a religion of works, it's what you do. And so there's ultimately no certainties. One thing that's common among all Muslim branches is that they are constantly asking Allah for forgiveness. There's a great feeling of guilt, a great deal of uncertainty, if one's sins are forgiven. They keep repeating, Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. Even the Prophet Muhammad sought forgiveness. Inna Rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, innahu layughanu ala qalbi wa anni astaghfiru Allah fil yawm mi'ata marra. If one person would have been certain by virtue of being the vessel, the very conduit of the word of God that came to be the Quran, the sacred text, even that pure vessel was uncertain. And if he was uncertain, can you imagine how uncertain everybody else is? Since the death of Muhammad, Islamic scholars have questioned whether the prophet was certain about his own place in heaven. In Surah 46, verse 9, Muhammad says, Ask any Muslim if they are sure of heaven. Not one person will answer yes. In fact, 
To answer yes is almost considered being blasphemous. That's because the Prophet himself didn't say it. He wasn't sure himself. Therefore, a Muslim cannot speak of heaven with confidence. But one group that's confident of a way to get to heaven are the followers of the Wahhabi branch of Islam. It is the absolute radical, rigid form of any branches of Islam. There is no gray area. It's either black or white. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Wahhabi Muslims believe jihad, or martyrdom, is the surest way to find Allah and guarantee heaven. Jihad is the ultimate price you can pay. Jihad is martyrdom. It's dying for the cause. If a Wahhabi Muslim is killed in the act of murdering a Shiite Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew, he's immediately declared a martyr and is guaranteed paradise. The martyr doesn't just get 72 virgins in heaven, but thousands of virgins. In parts of the Islamic world, some Muslims are seeking a more mystical tradition of Islam, less doctrinal, less rigid laws, and instead, a more personal relationship with Allah. They're called Sufi Muslims, and they're primarily found in Iran, Afghanistan, and Turkey. And Sufis believe that there should not be a, a distance between us and Allah. And by meditation and by singing, we actually can be synthesized with Allah. The Mevlevi Order, a Sufi group in Turkey, is famous for their whirling dances. Men will spin their bodies in repetitive circles, chanting prayers and singing songs, all the while keeping their arms open to receive a revelation from Allah. Ultimately, what they're trying to achieve is an experience, trying to experience something which is transcendent, something which is divine, that is not just about law and about legalism, but we need to feel because we doubt. And because we doubt, we need some assurance. Assurance for this life. Assurance for the hereafter all in search of God. Well, that's the explanation. If you die in the middle of jihad, then you're assured of paradise. Uh, and that's why they're doing it. And that's why the imams, the mosques, they're not condemning it because they recognize that it's the one sure way. Now, what does the Bible say about works? And what does the Bible say about adherence to the law? You find it in Galatians chapter 3. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you say the law is the way to heaven, then you have to rigorously observe it. And if you mess up on one part, then you've messed up on all of it. You can't fast enough. You can't read enough. You can't pray enough to make up for the things that you know that you've done wrong, where you know you've missed the mark. And that's why if you're under the law, you're under a curse. Well, here's the good news from Galatians. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, why did Paul use Abraham and say the blessings of Abraham are available to the Gentiles? Well, because he's the father of the faith. Here it is from Romans chapter 4. He, Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, if you want the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, all you have to do is not waver in faith that what Jesus did on the cross was for you, that he paid the price for you, 
that all your sins are forgiven. Is this a license to sin? No. The wages of sin are death. Every time we sin, a little part of us dies. But it is a license to obtain grace. Here it is in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, once you stand in that grace, once you understand that grace, then no longer are you a slave to the law, no longer are you a slave to works, and you are justified, which means it's just as if you never did it. You can stand free and holy before him, not because of what we do. It's not by works, lest anyone should boast. It's all based on what Jesus did and what he did on the cross, and that the power of his resurrection is now in us. So we don't have to go to him a hundred times a day asking for forgiveness. There, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we get the great blessing of Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of the great promise that Jesus gives to all of us. And all we have to do is, just like Abraham, believe, and it will be accounted to you for righteousness.